This morning, there are two things that are going to get me through this sermon. The first is honey lemon ginger tea. Horrible tasting, but good for your throat. And the second is prayer. So let's pray. God, we come before you this morning, and these words that we sung, they are our prayer. Revive us again each and every day as we wake to a brand new day. Revive us again that we may be shining examples of your love. And the way that happens is when this word, your word, takes root deep in our lives. And so may that be the truth this morning, that we hear your words and we become the people more and more that you have created us to be. It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, (coughs) amen. (coughs) This morning we're beginning a new, a really brief sermon series, three Sundays, and what's in a name? If you read the newsletter, you know that for the next three Sundays, we're going to be asking this question, what's in a name? American Reformed Church. We're going to be asking it backwards. We know this. We're starting with church, then Reformed, then ending with American. And we're doing that to help ourselves answer some questions about who we are and what our purpose is. This morning, we begin with the question around the word church. Should be simple, right? That's a big topic. And um, so I've been doing some thinking and reading, which I will explore with you in a little while. And instead of delving into one scripture like we normally do, we have a sampling, a smattering of scriptures to throw at you this morning. There's four of them, four separate ones, all found in 1 Corinthians, and they're each just one verse. And if you find yourself wondering why these four, you'll find out later in the message. So hang in with me. The first comes from 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For this reason, I sent you Timothy, Paul writes, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of the ways in Christ Jesus as I teach them everywhere in every church. Then we find ourselves moving on to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. To begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 22 reads, Do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? And then finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 19. In church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in tongues. This is the word of the Lord. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors. See all the people. We sat on well-worn olive green carpeting in the church basement with rapt attention focused on Ms. Van Hemert as she did this, this magic with her hands. It's no small task to command such a wiggly, waggly group of preschoolers, three and four-year-olds, but there we sat, mesmerized by the way she made her hands change shape with the cadence of the rhyme. Then she sat patiently as we each attempted to, to make our own little hands coordinate and mimic hers, and pretty soon we were all able to say together, here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors and see all the people. Fast forward, roughly 17 years. The the well-worn green olive carpeting has been exchanged for a concrete floor, The church basement replaced with an auditorium. The preschool cloud replaced with 18 to 21, 22-year-old college students. And instead of Ms. Van Hebert in front, a worship band crowns the stage. I remember practically nothing about the conference and the speakers, except for one in particular, who began with those familiar words that I heard so long ago come from Ms. Van Hemert's mouth. And then he followed that rhyme with these words. 
That catchy sentiment you may have learned long ago is wrong. The church isn't a place, it's a people. It should really go something like this. Here is the building, here is the steeple, open the doors, the church is the people. Place, people. That's not the first debate to take shape over the identity of the church. I've listened to passionate followers of Jesus argue also that the word church should only be used to describe the global group of believers, and local gatherings like ours should only be called congregations or communities. And perhaps you've noticed in the last few decades, churches changing their names to call themselves communities instead of churches. Global or local is the debate. Others say the true church is truly everyone, in every time, living or dead, visible or invisible. To use the word church to describe what we can see discounts the true nature of the church, invisible or visible. <clears throat> These books here, there's a chunk of them. These books are found within their words, the debates, the arguments. And after reading the great minds of oh, Shirley Guthrie, Barbara Brown Taylor, Frederick Buechner, Daniel Migliori, and Lamont, after reading these great minds, and yes, I read all these books in the last two weeks, some of them I reread a second time because this is the kind of stuff that your pastor geeks out over. But after reading these words about the arguments of place or people, visible or invisible, global or local, I had more questions than answers, more confusion than clarity. So I opened Imagine That's book, the Bible. And I read every single paragraph, sentence, phrase that has the word church in it. 116 different times. The word church is actually, in our English translations, is actually ekklesia in the Greek. It means assembly, community, meeting called together. Like I said, it's used 116 times in the New Testament exclusively and mostly by the writings of Paul. And here's what became blaringly clear. Church is visible and invisible local and global, place and people. That's right. In the writings of the New Testament, our spiritual ancestors of faith were as diverse and varied in their use of the word church as we are today. And there is no better example of this than the letter Paul wrote to the believers in the town of Corinth. We know it as 1 Corinthians. And Paul speaks specifically of the ecclesia, the church, 22 times, more than any other book in the New Testament. So we use that random smattering of verses this morning, as I said, not to delve deeply into them as we usually do, but rather as a sample, an example of the diverse ways in which Paul speaks of the nature of the church and the diverse ways that he writes of the ecclesia. He writes it as global and visible. Do you show contempt for the church of God, like Laura so beautifully showed us, and humiliate those who have nothing? Or, for this reason I sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of the ways in which Christ Jesus as I teach them everywhere, in every single church, both local and visible, Paul is saying. And then Paul writes this, in church, a place, in church. I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in tongues. And lastly, Paul says, to begin with, when you come together, you people come together as the church, I hear there are divisions among you. Out of the 22, these four speak of the church globally, locally, invisibly, visibly, place, and people. All of those covered in four verses. Rather than narrow down the way in which we understand and describe the church, Paul broadens. 
expands, allows for the church to rise above our own debates. Now, we can't spend our own time unpacking each of these debates and verses. If we did that, we'd be here for days rather than the like 55, 60 minutes that I plan on preaching this morning. So <clears throat> we're going to hone in our debate a little bit. We're going to hone it in and think about that rhyme I started with. Place or people? Paul has diverse ways of speaking about the church. But one thing is clear. Paul reminds us that Ms. Van Hemert was actually right to teach us the words of that rhyme so long ago. Here is the church, the building. Here is the steeple, open the doors, see all the people. For Paul, that's not just a nice sentiment. A pastor I know serves a local congregation in a large city. The neighborhood where the church claims its address, it's changed dramatically over the years, as many neighborhoods around churches have. And eventually, the majority of the members were commuting at least 20 or 30 minutes from their homes to the church, meaning they, people at the church didn't live around the church anymore. So, the congregation started a season of discernment. Should we move out of this place. They began the conversation with one another. Should we move to the suburbs? Where should we move? What would be the best place? And during this season of discernment, a local neighborhood resident who didn't attend the church came by to see the pastor. He had experienced a family tragedy and he said to the pastor, the only thing I could think of was that I needed to find God. So I came to the closest church. God's people have always longed for a place to find God, so to speak. Not too long after the people of God, way back in the Old Testament, left slavery in Egypt, and they began their wandering, told to us in Exodus, God, did you know this, gave them a specific place to gather and worship, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. This eventually turned into the permanent structure of the temple, and even when they were exiled later and they longed for a place, they built smaller places of worship to gather until they could return once again to the temple. So it's no surprise that the first Christ followers, who were also Jews, first joined together in worship at the temple before places and locations became necessary to avoid tension between traditional Jews and Christ-following Jews. And so Paul speaks frequently of these other locations and places throughout his writing, he speaks of Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla's house, which was a church, and Gaius' house hosted a church, and Nympha's house was a place of worship. Even the emperor's house became a church. And then Paul speaks about what is done in the physical church. In church, I would rather speak five words in my mind than 10,000 words in tongues, he writes. Now, it's true that they didn't build buildings specifically like this, but they had locations and they had places that they always met and called churches. The early followers of Christ knew where to show up and what place to attend to meet with and worship God. And they didn't just do it on a hillside one week and the city gate the next and a water well and then the market and then this place and then that place. Just like their great, 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 great grandparents found God in the tent of meeting and the temple long before them. They had places and locations to point people to meet together in the presence of God. One of my truly favorite authors, she's in this stack here, <clears throat> Anne Lamont. She tells a story of how she found her church, or maybe rather how the church found her. And it was all about location, place, address. You see, for a period of her life, Anne spent most of her time waffling between drunk and hungover. And after waking from particularly bad evenings, she would stumble down to her local flea market to get out of her house and she'd get lost in the colors and the crowds and the smells of the ethnic food and one particular Sunday she happened to wander down to that market a little after 11 and she heard music gospel music 
from a local church across the street from the market, and it washed over her. I'll let her words speak for themselves. It was called St. Andrew Presbyterian, and it looked homely and impoverished, a ramshackle building with a cross on top, but the music wafting out was so pretty, I stopped to listen. After that, I went back to St. Andrew about once a month. No one tried to con me into sitting down or staying. I always left before the sermon, but I loved the singing, even about Jesus. But I didn't want to be preached at about Jesus. However, something inside me that was stiff and rotting would feel soft and tender, and somehow the singing wore down all my boundaries and distinctions. Sitting there, then standing with them to sing, I felt bigger than myself, like I was being tricked into coming back to life. Eventually, Anne goes on to say that she sat through a sermon about Jesus. And then she let faith in Jesus wash over her just like the music. And St. Andrew Presbyterian became her church. In fact, in the following 12 years, she claims to have list less than, missed church less than 10 Sunday morning worship services. And it all started because of an address, a location across from the market, a place. Like St. Andrew Church, God has been using churches in their places and their locations for generations. The stories of the church in the path of the Underground Railroad, churches hiding Jews throughout Europe in the days preceding and during World War II. Current day churches now in inner cities are opening their doors as shelters and soup kitchens all because of their place. Obviously, there are times in history and countries currently where this place necessitates secrecy because of persecution, but we, friends, we do not live in one of those times or one of those countries. We have a location. We have an address. We have a place, and our address is not far from a college and an elementary school, and a high school, all places that make for exciting ministry opportunities. One of those started this last week with excitement amongst mentors and students in Kids Hope USA, a ministry at the Orange City Elementary School. We are located in a place, in a community, and a county that has ever-changing demographics, no longer as Dutch as it once was, and that presents challenging ministry opportunities. We find our place here at this address, in this city, in this county, as one of the most theologically and politically and socially diverse churches of membership in the area, unifying ministry opportunities, all because of an address, a location, a place. And God can use that place in a variety of ways. But it is also true that the church cannot be the church, regardless of its place, without what? People. The words that that college ministry speaker said rang true. Here is a building, here is a steeple, open the doors, the church is the people. That pastor I spoke about earlier, the one serving the church in the city and facilitating the discussion about whether or not to move the location into the suburbs, he was inspired by that local neighborhood man who stopped by the church to find God. And he shared that inspiration with some other people from the church, and they became inspired too, and thus began the seeds of an intentional neighborhood outreach ministry. And that church kept its place, its location, because the people heard God's call in their address. God has been gathering people together to bless the world since that long ago promise was spoken. Go from your country and your kindred to the land that I will show you, he said to Abram. I will make you a great nation so that you will be a blessing. In you, all the peoples of the world will be blessed. In the stories of the Old Testament, 
we find a God who spent massive amounts of time gathering and then regathering and then regathering people in order to carry out this promise. And as we move into the era from the Old Testament into the era of Jesus, God set about this work again as Jesus called people from diverse walks of life to follow and to learn and to live to carry out this blessing in the world. Then we find Paul. Paul right there in 1 Corinthians, he speaks of the church as diverse people who gather together, many members, one body. We heard these words to begin with, when you people come together as the church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I love that sentence. I love it. Paul gives us a glimpse that the early church is just like us, diverse, divisions, because it isn't just a place. It's a people who even in difference, even when opinions and ideas and thoughts don't line up, they come together to be the church. Anne Lamont, again, she describes St. Andrew Presbyterian that way. It's a Presbyterian church. It's filled with black Baptists, a man living with AIDS, a smattering of kids, and then people the likes of her, a single mom, a recovering addict. People who even in difference come together to be the church. She found St. Andrew's because of place, but she stayed because of people. She writes, My son Sam is the only kid he knows who goes to church, who is made to go to church, actually. He rarely wants to. Well, this is not exactly true. The truth is he never wants to go. But I make him because I can. I outweigh him by nearly 75 pounds. But that's only part of it. The main reason is that I want to give him what I've found in the world. Our funky little church is filled with people who are different but working for peace and freedom, who are out there in the streets and inside praying. They are writing letters. They are at shelters with giant platters of food. And when I was at the end of my rope, the people at St. Andrew tied a knot in it for me and helped me hold on. The church became my home in the old meaning of home that it's where when you show up, they have to let you in. Well, they let me in. And they even said, you come back now, you hear. In one of these books, one of these other books, Barbara Brown Taylor writes that the church is a group of people who takes turns filling in for Jesus understanding that none of us is equal to the task which all of us are called. People. But then, Brown Taylor continues with the reminder that the church is more than just people. She writes, By offering God's people a place where they may engage the steady practice of listening to divine words and celebrating divine sacraments, Church can help people gain a feel for how God shows up, not just in that place, but also in neighbors and mysterious strangers and more. That way, when they leave the place of the church, they mo no more leave God than God leaves them. The church, it's both place and people. It is local and global. It is visible and invisible. And whatever it is, place, people, local, global, visible, invisible, it is the task that remains the same. We're standing in, all of us, for Jesus. What's in a name? When we claim this name, church, we claim that we are a people, but we claim also that we are located at a place. 407 Albany Southeast in Orange City, Iowa. So perhaps that old rhyme could go something like this. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors, the church is the people. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Indeed, O oh God, we are thankful for the words that remind us that sometimes we get so caught up in debates that we forget to see your breadth and depth, the wideness and the broadness of your story and your call in our lives. This morning, we claim boldly this place that you have put us in this building, at this location, with this address, a place that is so close to a variety of groups and people and diversity that we can be a part of, that we can minister to. And so help us be a people who stand up and claim that place, open to the possibilities that this place has for us. It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen.